today is Memorial Day. And uh, we remember those, those heroes who have fallen so that we could have freedom. So would you stand with me this morning as we say the Pledge of Allegiance together, followed by a moment of silence to honor those who have given all for us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. You are not here by accident. And I don't mean necessarily this moment in time in history. I mean, I, I believe that you are not here at Hope Chapel by accident. I believe the Lord brought you here. Amen. And I believe the Lord has a reason and a purpose. And he has given you gifts and grace to use those gifts and walk out the ministry that he has given you. You know, I have, a, I have a little bit different way of pastoring than a lot of other pa pastors. Well, thank you, Pastor Donnie. We had no idea. Now, y'all be nice. Y'all be nice. Ain't no sense to be like that. But I believe, and I have to include my, my wife, Jewel, our co-pastor in this, that we believe that ministry does not surround or circle the pastor. We believe that ministry in the church, particularly in Hope Chapel, because that's our church, it's your church, but we believe that ministry in the church does not revolve around the great and powerful Oz, <laughs> Pastor Donnie. I don't baptize everyone that would like to be baptized at a baptismal service. I don't lead communion every communion Sunday. I don't preach every Sunday. I don't believe that I'm the only one that can lead someone to Jesus here at Hope Chapel. I'm not the only one that prays and anoints for the sick. You see, I believe that while Jewel and I are called, and, and Pastor Lala, who's in children's church, are called to this church to pastor, that it's not about us. It's about us. Because you have been given gifts and ministry. That God has then given you the grace to walk out, to, to fulfill the calling that he has in your life. I can see the fear. You're looking at me like, he's crazy. He really believes this. I do. I believe that a church is not designed, was never meant to revolve around a pastor or any person for that matter. It is to revolve around, and it is all about Jesus, Amen. period. Amen. And we are given gifts, all of us, not just pastors. We are all given gifts 
to minister to the church. In fact, pastors have been elevated to this place that if we're not careful, we'll begin to steal the glory from the one who actually died for his church. And here's the other thing. It's not just one. There's actually five different callings in a church. It's not just pastor. See, we believe, we believe that you are given gifts and ministry. But the challenge is, is that in pastoring and the way pastoring has developed, particularly in our, in our culture, is that it leaves the impression that the only one that can do ministry within the church is the one who has the card that says pastor. And that's not true. That's not even biblical. You have gifts given to you by God for ministry here. Do you remember last week's message? We are all in this together. together. Well, this morning, you all, we find out just how deep we are in this thing called church together. Because church, I believe we can do this. We can do this. Would you bow your heads with me? Father God, thank you for your mercy and your goodness. Lord, I pray that you'll take your word forward into our hearts. May it take deep root that we leave here changed. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name, amen, amen. We are going to be in, wait for it, Ephesians. I know some of you are shocked by that. We've been in Ephesians for seven weeks now. But we're going to be in Ephesians 4 again today, and we're going to start in verse 7. And what I want you to understand, what, where, where we're going today, is that the Bible teaches us that we are given spiritual gifts and ministry by the Holy Spirit, and then the grace by Jesus to actually walk out and fulfill those ministries. And that's not always about the pastor. Look at the person next to you and say, he's talking to you right now. Look at verse 7 with me. It says, Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, that word now, go back for me, Dave. Sorry, buddy. Now is a connective word. Remember the word therefore? From, from last week, therefore. Well, therefore and now, they're connected words. And what now is doing is it's saying, wait a minute, now in reference to what was just said. So Paul had just written, if you remember from last week, that we are to walk in unity. We are one body. We are one church. And we are to walk in unity, then, especially when we disagree. When we disagree, it never becomes more valuable to walk in unity than at that moment. So Paul's saying, now that you understand that you are to be unified, one body, now understand that you have individual gifts, that a body is made up of different parts. So that's what he's saying. So now, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure, that word measure is metron, and it literally means the amount that was given is in relation, the grace that was given to you is in relation to the gift that Christ has given you. You have been given gifts by Jesus. If you know him as Savior, he has given you gifts. He said, Donnie, you've said that like eight times. I know, but you still look at me like you don't believe me. I wouldn't lie to you. And it says that he has given you the measure of grace in connection with the gift that he's given you. So you have what you need to do what God has called you to do. You have been given the amount of grace that you need to do what God has called you to do. 
you're not really going to make me say it again, are you? <laughs> it's not like he gives you something and goes, good luck with that. No, he gives you gifts and then he gives you the amount of grace that you need to carry them out. Look at verse 8. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. He gave, he gave gifts to the people. Verse 9. But what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. This is really interesting. We talk a lot about the birth of Jesus, don't we? A lot about the birth of Jesus. We talk a lot about the resurrection of Jesus. Quite frankly, without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. It's the resurrection is the power, right? We also talk a lot about the second coming. Did you know he's coming back? Yes. Did you know he's not coming as a baby? Right. Come on, somebody. He's coming back as victor, as king, as, as, as the king of glory. But we don't talk a lot about the ascension. You see, when Jesus was resurrected, he walked the earth for about 40 days, give or take, and then he was ascended. It's the first part of Acts. He, was, he ascended to heaven. It means he went back. And the language here is from that, that, that center part in verse 8. When he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. He gave gifts to the people. That's out of Psalm 68. And, and in his book, A Life of Holy Intimacy and Power, Tim Thomas describes it this way. I love this picture. The imagery here is one of a triumphant army general parading the defeated army before a cheering crowd. Amen. Jesus won, y'all. He, I can't say that. He <laughs> won. Yeah, but I don't have to repent. <laughs> Jesus won. And that picture is of this conquering general coming back to a cheering crowd. Think of a ticket, for, a ticket tape parade, right, at the end of a war. Parading the defeated army before a cheering crowd, yes. right? The defeated army is actually us. I think this, hang with me. This is such an incredible picture. I don't want you to miss this. Before you knew Jesus as Savior, the Bible tells us you were an enemy of God. He loved you, sent his son to die for you, but you could not even be with him in his presence because of the sin in our lives. We we're enemies of God. But once we accept Jesus, his payment for our sin, once we say, I will accept his payment for my sin, now I'm a friend of God. I'm his son I'm his, or his daughter. But when Jesus went back to heaven and ascended, the captives that he brought were us. Be sure to let this sink in. Jesus is a really nice guy. He did a lot of really nice things. But he is the lion of Judah. Huh. He is the conqueror. He freed us from our sin by laying his life down. So we come with him. When we accept Jesus as Savior, we now become that army that's been conquered. And here's the thing. With what Tim had put in his book, that, that picture of the general conquering and bringing, parading his defeated army. In that moment that the crowd, or, or more likely, the, the, the defeated army would give him gifts. Here, Don't kill us. Don't destroy us. They would give that conquering general gifts. But that's not our Lord. Our Lord says, I will come. I will die for you. I will conquer sin in your life so that we can be friends. And I will give you gifts. God's like that. We think we have him all figured out. He says, no, 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 no. You don't have to give me gifts. I give you ministry gifts. Why? To fill all 
things. I need to say this again. Christianity, believing, church, whatever you want to call it, is always all about Jesus. Always. It's all about him. And so when he ascended, he gave us gifts with the grace to walk them out, conquering hero, to fill the entire earth with him. I can tell you something about God that you may not know. He does not want anyone to go to hell. No one. You think of the absolute worst person that you could possibly think about. And he does not want them in hell. And his purpose of giving us gifts, did you see that what I said? You see what I did there? I slipped that in. I didn't say give me gifts. You see, I said give us gifts is to fill the earth with Jesus. Now, how do we do that? Look at verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And he himself, Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and some teachers. Jesus was the ultimate apostle, the ultimate prophet, the ultimate evangelist, the ultimate pastor, and the ultimate teacher. There has never been, nor will there ever be, a man like Jesus Christ who walked the earth. He was both God and man. He was all of them wrapped up into one absolutely perfect person. And so to fill the earth with his glory, with him, he gave some of us to be apostles, some of us to be prophets, some of us to be evangelists, some of us to be pastors, and some of us to be teachers. I am not an apostle. An apostle is someone who goes and does something brand new that's never been done, takes the gospel someplace it's never been. I'm not an apostle, but some of you may be. A prophet is someone who hears from God and then shares what they've heard. I'm not a prophet, but some of you may be. An evangelist is someone who brings the triumphant good news of Jesus so that people can be saved. I'm not an evangelist, but some of you may be. I am a pastor. I'm a shepherd. That's my calling. But some of you may be. I'm not a teacher. Teacher is someone who teaches the word of God, breaks it down so people understand it. But you may be. I've, I've, you know, I have functioned in all of these gifts at different times. I've led people to Jesus. I've been apostolic. Jewel and I, with a hand of, of 20, other, <laughs> 20 other people, planted a church in Virginia. That's very apostolic. I've moved in those. I've, I've had a word from God for someone to, that their shoulder to be healed. I've moved in those gifts. But my gifting, my calling is pastoral. I'm a teacher. I teach the word on Sunday. But someone that teaches the word, someone who is apostolic, someone who is a prophet, someone who's an evangelist. That's their calling. If you'll allow me, that's their jam. And that could be you. Why did Jesus give us five? I heard a pastor say that he was interviewing another pastor. And he said, well, I'm all five. I'm, a, I'm an apostle, I'm a prophet, I'm an evangelist. I'm a pastor, and I'm a teacher. And the other pastor said, oh, so you're Jesus. <laughs> a 
We are given different gifts because that's who God has called us to be. He's given us gifts in ministry. But make no mistake, you have gifts from God to use for his glory. And here is, this is so important because we're about to see where a lot of things go sideways. Look at verse 12. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ. These five gifts are given to the body of Christ to build them up, not build the called ones up. Come on now. These gifts are not given to build up the called ones. They are given to build up the church. It says to equip the saints. Some of you have never been called this before. Look at the person next to you and say, you are a saint. (laughs) Believers, for the work of the ministry, To build up what? The body of Christ. A church is not an organization. A church is not a building. A church is what? People. The body of Christ. We are the church. And these five callings in the church, these offices of the church, were given for the building up of the church. Not the building up of the individual who was called. It's so important because we get, it, we get it wrong too many times in church. Everything starts to revolve around the pastor. Let me give you another, let me give you some pictures here. I want you to see, at, at least I got somebody saying amen. <laughs> me and you, loose to the end. Everybody knows what an apostle does. An apostle comes into town and they regale us with all of the new things that they're doing, the way the gospel is being presented to people who have never heard the gospel before. It's a wonderful experience. They hold a conference or they come to church and an apostle shares all that's going on. They blaze new territory. They're missionaries. They take the word. They take the gospel into places, right? But see, a true apostle doesn't stop there. A true apostle, according to verse 12, helps you and I how to be apostolic and how to take the gospel into new places. It's not just about them being recognized for what they're doing. It's about them teaching the church how to do what they're doing. That's an apostle. Because it's not built for them to just simply receive praise. It is built for them to share what God is doing so that you get excited and will be part of what God is doing. Prophet. Prophets come into town and they hear from the Lord and they share the word of the Lord. They get a conference, they get a YouTube channel, they get a Facebook page, and they share what God shares with them. Great, but that is not the job or the office of the prophet in the church. The prophet in the church is to teach you to hear from God. Can I just tell you, you don't need anybody to tell you how to hear from God. You are just as saved as they are. You can hear God's voice right where you are. You don't need someone, but it, sometimes it is helpful to have someone teach you how to do that, how to get quiet before. That's what a prophet does. An evangelist, this joke's been around forever. They blow in, they blow up, they blow out. <laughs> and listen, we need a apostles. We need prophets. We need evangelists who will come and they'll have crucifixion. They'll have conferences and people will get saved. Yes and amen. But that is not the end of their job in the church. Their job is to teach us how to reach people for Jesus. It's not just about the office and the glory. And look, oh, what a great thing. Look at the prayer they made. Fifteen people got saved. Yeah, but what about the one working next to you at work? That will never step foot in a church. We need to learn from the evangelists how to share Jesus. So people can come to know him. Because there are people that you never meet. I'll never meet them. They'll never come here. But they'll listen to you. And so an evangelist, yes, they preach and people get saved. 
But that's not the end of it. They've got to teach pastors. Everybody knows that pastors' job is to run themselves into the ground to where they are either retired or dead or wore out in a sane asylum caring for the sheep. Everybody knows that. No. My job is to care for you, to love you. It's the easiest job I've ever had in my whole life. But that is not where it ends. If I'm not teaching you how to care for other people, I'm failing as your pastor. You got to give a rip. And I got to teach you how to do that. That's part of my calling. It's not enough just for me to care for you. You have to be able to care for other people. The teacher. I love this one. I love this one. A teacher teaches the word of God in a way that the lights come on and the the heavens open and the angels descend. Like, you get it. You're like, oh my goodness, I've never seen John 3.16 like that before. That's amazing. And yes, that's what they do, but that's not the end of their calling. Their calling is to teach you how to open God's word and have it change your life. While you're by yourself in your little quiet place, wherever that is, Amen. that's what a teacher does. Are you seeing that this is not about, we in, the, in our culture, we make it too much about the individuals versus the church, which is why the individuals were given. We are not, listen to me, all of us who have this gift and have this office, we are not here to be served. We are here to serve. the church. That's why we exist. Welcome to the club, y'all. Because some of you have the same gifts. Why would Jesus do this? Well, we've already said to fill the earth with him through these different offices that no one person could be great at. So he spreads it around. But look what it says in verse 13. Until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of God's son growing into maturity and a stature measured by what? How much is the church like Jesus? Because it is the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers who are to help us walk in the fullness of Christ to be more like Jesus. Do you know, do you know that the church would not be nearly as irrelevant as it is in America if our church was more like Jesus? If believers were more like Jesus, we would not struggle to be relevant. And that's what this is about. This is about having gifts that you all have, that I have, that other people in other churches have together, sharing Jesus, that it is now the fullness of Jesus throughout the entire earth. Everything that we do is about Jesus. When I was being licensed, I'll tell you a really quick story. When I was being licensed, they set you before a board of, of three or four men or, or women, and they ask you questions, and they are, they're testing your knowledge. What do you know about polity, and what do you know about doctrine and theology? And they're just like one after another, one after another. Well, I'd studied all night. And the one pastor said, Donnie, if somebody came to you and asked you, what is Foursquare? What is our denomination? What is Foursquare? Baby, I was ready. I had the flags. I had the colors. I was ready. So I don't even remember what I said, but it was awesome. (laughs) Awesome. And he said, so what if the person sitting in front of you has no idea what you're talking about? They don't know anything about colors, Holy Spirit, Jesus, Savior, coming King. They don't don't know. They just want to know 
What is Foursquare, this church that you go to? That's all they want to know. What would you tell them? And I went, <laughs> he said, how about this? When somebody asks you what's Foursquare about, just tell them it's all about Jesus. So guess what? When people ask me about Foursquare, the very first thing out of my mouth is we're just all about Jesus. Hope Chapel, we're just all about Jesus. Because Jesus, the gospel of Jesus is the answer to all of it. All of it. The fullness of Christ, verse 14. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. That is a powerful verse. Do you know the reason why the church gets swayed with all kinds of doctrines? Because apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers aren't building up and strengthening the body of Christ like we're called to do. That's why. Because what this is saying is that when all of the gifts work together across the body of Christ and Christ is dominant and centered of the church, it's all about Jesus, that then we will no longer be little children tossed by waves and blown around by every wind of teaching. Because we will know the truth. Verse 15 says, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head. And I, I'm sorry, I don't see my name there. Who is the head? Christ. Speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head. Christ. Christ is king. Christ is the king of glory. He laid his life down for the church. And we all, all of us have gifts have ministry. Some of you are apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. And some of you are sitting there this morning and you're saying, he's obviously, obviously talking about someone else. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that is exactly why you would be a fantastic apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Because it's never about us. It's always about him. Amen. Always about him. Amen. Finally, verse 16 says, from him, the whole body. Who's the whole body? Us. us, the church. Fitted and knit together. I just love that. Fitted and knit together. Like Legos. Just fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament produced, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by proper working of each individual part. None is greater than the other. Amen. Apostles are no better than pastors. Pastors are no better than apostles. Prophets are no better than evangelists. And on and on and on and on. They are equally meant to build up the body of Christ. Each has its part. Each has its ligament the way it's tied together into the body. And Jesus did it that way on purpose. You know why? Because that's the blueprint of heaven. There is nobody in heaven or who will, will, will be in heaven that God loves more than any other. There is no one that will be in hell that his heart will not break for the same. Don't you see? You got gifts, y'all. Yes. And our church and the church, Big C, Cap, they, we need you. Yes. Amen. It's not just me as pastor. I'm one. But all of a sudden, if we've got apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists and we're in the church and we're working together, tell me what we can't do by bringing the fullness of Christ into our community and into our church. June 9th, 
You heard this this morning. We will celebrate all our volunteers. Wonderful picnic lunch. Listen, if you don't volunteer, come. We'll feed you. You'll feel guilty, and then you'll be serving. <laughs> you know what's odd about our church? It really is. Is that we don't have an 80-20 problem. A lot of churches have an 80-20 problem. 20% of the people serve and do 80% of the work. We don't have that problem. We got like a 98 and two problem. We got 98% of our church. I, I, it's unbelievable to me how many people will be at that volunteer celebration. It's like all of the church. There's, it's, only, it's just a few. Like, it's unheard of. Y'all are servants. You serve. But it's time for some of you to lead. It's time to lead. Time to lead. Listen, there are apostles, prophets, and evangelists, and pastors, and teachers sitting in your seat. And it's time for you to step out into what God is calling you. And some of you right now, you know. It's right here. You know God is calling you. You've been running for, trust me, I know. I ran for 25 years. I know what it's like to run. I know. He knows. It's time, y'all. It's time. Our church, you. And you need you. Because God's got a call in your life. God's got something for you to do. And listen, if you think in your mind, there is absolutely no way I can do this. I say to you, you're in a good place. Because the truth is, you can't. You can only do it by what God is stirring in your soul and what he's giving you the grace to do. It is time for you to discover your gift, walk in your gift, and you can do this. You know, as I shared, our vision of ministry at Hope Chapel is not pastoral centric, doesn't revolve around me, doesn't revolve around Pastor Julian, doesn't revolve around Pastor Lala. You see, our philosophy of ministry, of church ministry, is that you are not here, listen to me, you are not here to help us fulfill our calling. We are here to help you fulfill yours. That's why Hope Chapel exists. And church, we can do this. I know you don't believe it, but I believe in you because we serve a God. Ooh, we serve a God, great and mighty, who hung the moon, lit the sun, Name the stars. You can do this. Would you stand with me this morning? I want to pray over you and I'm going to have Pastor Julie come and, and give our benediction. Father, some of us are, we're afraid. We're sitting here trying to figure out what, what did I just hear? Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come, bring peace, but stir our hearts. And Father, if there is an apostle or a prophet or an evangelist or a pastor or a teacher, as I believe there are, 
then God, I pray that you would begin to do a work in their life right now. That that stirring they sense, that uneasiness, that's you saying it's time to step out. It's time to go. It's time to lead. God, please, 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 Father, don't let this be about the pastors of this church. Let it be about your church. Jesus, be the center of it all. In Jesus' name, amen.